Okay, hello everybody. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, welcome along um, to a source event. If you haven't been with us to a source event before, uh, it is a series of online research software uh, events. Uh, my name is Terry. Uh, also hosting this session is Andrew. Um, we are, we have today is we have a software demo, demo by Merid, Meredith. Oh, sorry, I got it all wrong. Oh, the, Meredith, it's okay, Meredith. no one can get it right first Meredith. time. <laughs> My apologies, it went straight in one ear and out the other when you was introduced yourself earlier. Um, Meredith uh, and Hannah, I don't think Hannah can be with us today, uh, talking about web apps and the power of Python. But before we start, I do have a few notices. So could everybody uh, just be aware that we do have a code of conduct and we would ask you to follow it. Uh, the link is in our, the slides and on our website if you want to take a look at it. Um, uh, program, we've got lots of other source events coming up. Uh, so there's uh, a couple of talks happening on February the 11th. Uh, we've got an interesting sort of event about RSE careers in France, because apparently the RSE career idea is all solved over there. So do check, check that out. That's on the February 23rd. Um, and we've got a few more events already coming up into March and more coming. Um, so uh, we are recording today. Uh, just to let everybody know, the recording has already started. Um, so if you do not wish to appear in the recording, please turn your mic video off, keep your microphone muted. Um, you can obviously still participate and talk to us and, and ask questions in the Zoom chat. Um, we will not read out your name if you do, don't want us to, um, but that because that is not recorded. Um, and I think that is everything I have to say. So I will hand over to Meredith, slightly better. Uh, talking about web apps and the power of Python. Thank you very much. So my name is Meredith. I am, I suppose I could be most charitably be described as an ex-researcher. My career consists of a long march away from the lab bench. I was a neuroscientist for undergrad and then uh, did my PhD in computer science and now I have run away to industry. Uh, but uh, I am here because uh, we have built a tool that we think might actually help you with your practice, uh, and I would like to show it to you. So uh, it is called uh, Anvil. Uh, it is a platform for building full stack web apps with nothing but Python. So uh, specifically, it interactive applications on the web. Uh, which would normally require a very large stack of complexity, uh, web servers, databases, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, frameworks on top of those. Uh, we've uh, tried to make that simple. And I would like to show you a little bit about Anvil through a few scenarios that are uh, somewhat stylized researchy sorts of problems. Uh, just to get this out of the way straight away, uh, yes, this is a company. Yes, we do sell this. Uh, but I am intimately aware of the budgeting situation in research scenarios. And uh, every single thing I am doing, I'm going to show you today, you can do on our free plan, which absolutely anybody can sign up with. Uh, what's more, uh, the actual business end of Anvil is entirely open source. And I will actually be showing you as part of this demo uh, how you can take an application you've built and package it up with uh, purely open source software of the sort you could use for, for example, experimental reproducibility. So uh, I am not really here to, say, uh, to uh, tell you anything. Uh, I am here to show you about something that I kind of wish had existed back when I was doing research. So uh, to begin with, I'm going to show you uh, a, a sort of very small web application, uh, the sort of thing, you know, minimal web application it's got. Uh, it's going to have user input, it's going to have data recording. It's the kind of thing that you might use, say, if you were doing some, some kind of survey based data collection. Uh, so I'm going to sign into Anvil, or we will uh, close our eyes and actually keep them open, watch the screen, uh, and pretend uh, that we are, let's say, psychologists doing a mood survey. So here we are in the Anvil editor. Uh, this is a web page, and this here is a toolbox of things you can put onto that web page. And so uh, if I want to collect this kind of data, I'm probably going to want a card on which I prompt the user to, let's start with, uh, enter their name. 
Uh, and I've done that by dragging and dropping a component onto the page and then changing its properties. Uh, we're going to have a text box for them to be able to answer that question with. Uh, I'm going to call this name box. Uh, everything in Anvil has a variable name so that you can access it from code. And once they've entered their name, we're actually going to want to get some data from them. So let's ask them how they're feeling. Uh, and we are going to give them a drop down uh, for that question. Uh, I'm going to call it the mood drop down, and it will have options such as happy, sad, and angry. Okay, when they filled out that data, uh, let's give them a button to push to submit it. And make it a little bit more prominent. And let's, let's display a thank you message so they know something has happened. So underneath that, I'm going to put a label. I'm going to call it message label. Uh, and we can change some more properties of our text here. So we're going to make it centered and we're going to make the font a little bit bigger and so on. Okay, so we've just built our entire user interface. And you may have noticed that was really quite fast, a lot faster than you would have been able to do it with HTML and CSS. But the really cool thing is that everything here is backed by Python. So if I double click this button, I am now editing the Python code that runs in the web browser when the user clicks the button. And you can see all the things I dragged and dropped onto my page are available as variables in my Python code. So if I want to set the text of the message label based on the text they put in the name box and the item they've chosen from the mood dropdown, I can go self.messagelabel.text is Let's say hello, name box what text. Uh, I here you are. Let's get the selected value from the mood dropdown. Okay, let's run it. Uh, it's called mood. Server. Okay, so my name is Meredith, and I am currently angry. So we just built a an interactive web application. And actually, it's already live on the internet. Uh, let's give it a nice URL, moodsurvey.amble.app. OK, so we have built and deployed a web application with nothing but Python really quite quickly. And any of you can go to mood-survey.amble.app right now and interact with the application that I've just built. So. This was all very nice and fast, but of course, if we're collecting data, we probably want to retrieve it and store it somewhere. Uh, all of this code, I remind you, runs in the web browser. We actually compile this Python to JavaScript, and it runs in the browser when you open this page. Uh, so to record this data, we're going to have to send it back to the server. So to do this, I'm going to add a server module, which is a Python module that runs on the Anvil server perfectly ordinary Python module, and I'm writing a perfectly ordinary Python function. It takes a name, mood, and uh, and print something out. But what I can do here is I can tag this function at anvil.server.callable. And that means that I can call this function from the web browser. So let's go back to the code that runs in the web browser. And when they click the button, now we're going to call Anvil uh, server call, submit data. It wants these two arguments. So it wants the name. So let's put the text from the name box. And it wants the mood. So let's set the selected value from the mood dropdown. And let's make the message label now display. Thanks for participating. So now if I run this, our editor is happy. It says, thanks for participating. And we have some output in the log in the application's logs. And that yellow background means that that was a print statement running on the server being driven by <clears throat> this user interface we just built with nothing but Python. Notice what we didn't have to do there. We did not have to set up Flask. We did not have to configure a server somewhere. It, just worked. But we didn't have to mash all of our data into JSON and decide what HTTP method to use. We just called a Python function. Uh, now, 
In practice, the application logs aren't a good place to record all of our data. We'll want to put it in a database. And of course, if you already have a database, then this is just Python and you can just stick that data in the database using the normal Python mechanisms. But Anvil has a database built in if you don't have your own. And so we're going to use that. This is the data table service. It's a database backed by Postgres. So you can happily stick gigabytes of data into this thing. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit less ambitious. I am going to make a table of the responses. It's going to have a text column for the name. And it's going to have a date and time column for when that was entered. And then it's going to have a text column for the mood. Yes, let's put that there. OK, so I've now built the database. This table is app tables responses, And it's available from our code, just like those text boxes and buttons were. So if I go back to my server, I can take app tables responses. I can add a row to it. Uh, the name is going to be this name that was passed in. The mood is going to be this mood that was passed in. And the when is going to be date time. But now, let's import that. So now, if I run this, and I say that Reddit is happy and Bob is sad and Sarah is happy. OK, so we, we've, uh, and yes, Mike is angry. OK, so if we go and look at our database, we will see that uh, we've got quite a bit of data. Oh, hello, Hans. OK, you, said you can see that this app really is publicly accessible. Other people are entering data into it. So we've just built and deployed a database-backed web application that is actually succeeding at collecting data right now. And we could declare victory. We could say, OK, this works. I'm going to download the contents of this table as a CSV file and process it myself. And that will be a perfectly valid thing to do. But I'm going to I'd am going i like to show you a little bit more about Anvil. So I'm going to build an interface uh, for visualizing that data uh, as part of our web app. And so to do this, I'm going to add a form, which is uh, another page in our application. Uh, and on it, I'm going to put a plot component. So Anvil has native support for the Plotly plotting library, which is pretty popular. Uh, you can also use a ton of other plotting libraries. We have guides for them, but this is the one that we have uh, out of the box in the toolbox. Uh, search Anvil plotting libraries if you want, if you want the full rundown. Uh, we have guides to using uh, pretty much all of the common ones. Now, before I get into how to get the data from the database and plot it on this uh, on this chart, uh, we we have a data confidentiality problem because, of course, we don't want any old so and so to be able to rock up and retrieve all the data from our database. So we're going to need some form of authentication. Someone's going to have to prove who they are before they can get at this data. Anvil actually supports this out of the box. Uh, we have something called the user service, which has all sorts of login forms and authentication mechanisms built in, email validation, Google, Facebook, uh, all sorts of enterprise authentication, you name it. I'm going to enable Google authentication because that's really quick for me. And I'm going to say that the only valid user in our database is Anvil.works, which is me. And now I can call anvil.users.login with form, and it will do the whole Google login flow for me. So OK, so we have a way of logging me in. Uh, I just need to uh, make sure we check those credentials when we retrieve the data. So let's write that function that retrieves the data. So uh, we make another callable function. We call it get data. And in here, we check, well, is anvil.users.get the current user? If it's not none, if someone's logged in, then we can return app tables dot responses, and we can just return a full search every row in that table. OK, that was easy. That was our user authentication and data retrieval. Let's go plot it. So we're on form two. Let, let's call this results form. OK, so in the constructor of this form, when it opens, we need to do two things. One is we need to actually show that login form. So let's call that function. And then we need to actually retrieve our data. 
Uh, so our data is amble.server.call get data, which will now succeed because we're logged in. And then we can plot it. So we, the data on this plot is going to be a plot the histogram whose x values are, uh, let's see, for r in data. Let's see, uh, we want the mood. So, okay, so the x values of the histogram are the moods columns from all those database rows. Uh, let's set this is the startup form. So this is the form we see when we run our app. And here we go. I'm being prompted to log in. I'm getting the usual Google login prompt. And now I'm seeing a histogram of all these responses. Okay, let's wire this up to the rest of the app. So let's move back to form one as our startup form. And I'm just going to put a link up here in the navigation bar that says uh, results. And when you click this link, we open the results form. That's how you move from page to page. And so now we have this application that can gather data. And also, if you click the button, can demand you log in, authenticate you, and then display the data. Again, pretty straightforward stuff, all done with nothing but Python, not having to faff around uh, with a whole bunch of JavaScript frameworks to get anything working. OK, so we've just built a reasonably full featured application. Uh, and now let's talk reproducibility, because obviously this application is actually in our hosted service, which is terribly convenient. It mean, meant I didn't have to set up any servers. It mean, I meant I didn't have to configure everything. It was just there out of the box. However, uh, we do in fact want to be able to take this application and guarantee that I'm going to be able to run it in exactly the same form uh, in five years time uh, if somebody wants to reproduce my work. Uh, and there are many other reasons you might want to run something outside our hosted service. Uh, so Anvil has an open source app server that does everything that this hosting, hosting service does, but it can do it on your local machine and it's fully open source. And so to use it, uh, I need to get the app out of Anvil's hosted service and onto my computer. And the way I do this is actually with Git, because every Anvil application is, in fact, a Git repository. And I can clone it onto my machine. So I'm going to do exactly that. Get a clone the file. There we go. OK, that is. Uh, my application. Uh, here is the you know the source code to that results form. It's it's just a Python program running on my machine. Well, not running yet, but soon, because what we can do is we can pip install the Anvil app server, and then we can just say serve this directory as an application. And it is now, oh, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, got the command line arguments wrong there. It's now, oh, come on. There we go. Really? Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, it's, it's actually complaining that the current directory doesn't contain an Anvil app, which is quite right, because we're actually not in the right directory here. Uh, so let's try that again. We run the app server from inside this directory we've just checked out. It is now going to start a web server. And there we go. Our application is available at localhost 3030. And here is that application I built running entirely on my local machine with no dependency on our hosted service. So you can happily stick this in a VM image or in a Docker file, whatever you use for reproducibility, or just host it on your own machine uh, if the uh, IRB won't let you store data on our servers. No problem. OK, so this was one scenario. This was a classic web application. It's got sort of forms and buttons and data entry and it serves and save serves and saves stuff out of a database uh, and that's great if you want to create a classic web application uh, but uh, a whole bunch of research applications aren't quite like that 
So uh, I'd like to walk you through a slightly different scenario. Um, I, oh gosh, the Zoom hand raising thing. If we were in person, I would ask people to hands up who uses Jupyter Notebooks, but I'm pretty sure that basically every hand in the room is going to be up. So let's skip past this and assume you already have one. So let's say that uh, we are supporting, uh, uh, we are supporting uh, biologists and we want to do some processing of microcrafts. Uh, and this, it, you know, this might involve some, you know, machine learning models running over those microcrafts, for example. Now, I am no longer a biologist, so I have in fact grabbed an off-the-shelf model that tells the difference between dogs and cats. I, I, I trust we can, you know, we, we can align the differences in our minds. Uh, this is a machine learning model, as you might expect to find it in your Jupyter notebook, which is to say uh, there is, you know, here's a function that will, uh, you can pull it on a pillow image, uh, it will put it through the model and tell us what the model says. And here's some test code. So, you know, we can load, load an image from the file system uh, and just get a prediction on it. And the model is going to tell us whether it's a dog or a cat. So here's a sample image, here's the model's results. Now, the problem here is that we are working with uh, bench biologists who do not like operating in this kind of interface, or at least many of them don't. So what we want to do is we want to build a user interface that they can use that still, uh, that still lets us use everything we've built in this Jupyter Notebook. So I'm going to go into Anvil and create a new application. And what I'm going to use here is something called the uplink. And the uplink is what allows you to link something like a Jupyter Notebook to this Anvil app in the cloud. So the uplink is a library you can pip install anywhere in the world. And if you enable it for your app, you get an uplink key. And this allows uh, you to call anvil.server.connect from your code wherever it's running and have that code effectively be able to do everything you could do from that yellow server code we were seeing earlier. So I go to my Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to connect to my application. And that's it. This Jupyter Notebook is now as much part of my application as anything else. And I can do anything I could do from Anvil server code, including defining a callable function. So I want, a fun I want to call a function from the web that's going to run in this Jupyter Notebook uh, let's see, we want it to classify an image. So if we uh, we pass it an image, we want it to run it through the model and then return the results. And then we can uh, use that to build a user interface on it. So uh, that, that image, we just received it as an argument. Again, nothing uh, difficult or fancy about uh, moving uh, blobs of binary data around. Uh, it will ar arrive as an Anvil media object. So the simplest thing to do is just to write it to a temporary file. And then we can load it into Pillow. So now all we need to do is run it through the uh, model. And then we can return, well, dog, if the score is less than 0.5 else cat, and then let's return the score as well. So that's it. My app now has access to this function that's running in my Jupyter Notebook uh, from wherever it's, it wants to call it. So let's go back into this application and call the function from my notebook. Well, first we need to build a UI. So uh, let's see, we're going to want a file loader so the user can upload a file. And then when they've uploaded it, we want to we're going to want to display what they've uh, uploaded. And then we're going to display the model's verdict on that input data. So let's call this results label. Uh, let's, we can make it a little bit bigger as well. And let's put a spacer in here so that it uh, lines up a little bit better with the image. OK. So again, we built our user interface. And when the user uploads something uh, into this application, uh, 
we want to get the results. So uh, it was the, oh, it was the verdict and the score were the return values of anvil.server.call and it was classify image. And it wanted the one parameter, which is the file that was uploaded. And this is, uh, it's called an anvil media object. It lets you pass around this binary data just as an argument to a, uh, to a function like that. And now we just need to display the results. So the result label, uh, the text there becomes, uh, I guess the verdict and then the score, let's format that nicely. And the on the image components, uh, we just display the input file. Okay, let's give this a run. Uh, so I'm going to upload an image into this. There we go. It has correctly classified this as a dog. And what that did is it sent that file from my computer, uh, uploaded it to the web, and then called this function that's still running inside my Jupyter notebook to query this, uh, uh, this machine learning model I've built. So here, this is an example of how you can take something that is a sort of slightly more classic uh, scientific exploratory computing, and uh, you can put a user interface on it so that you don't need to be able to use a Jupyter notebook in order to drive it. And again, we did this all with nothing but Python. We didn't have to fret with web servers. I didn't even have to uh, fret with firewalls because uh, the uplink made a connection up to Anvil. Uh, so I can actually happily run this uh, on a computer that's uh, anywhere in the world that's you know, on this uh, little domestic connection didn't have to stand up any servers or anything. Okay, so we're nearly at the point where I'm going to uh, open this up to questions, um, but I would just like to run you through one more scenario. Uh, it's another way of using the uplink, and it's, uh, but this time we're not going to connect to Jupyter Notebook. Uh, this time, let's uh, do some experimental automation. So I've, I've mocked up uh, an instrument uh, that uh, we can get some kind of reading for. So say we have some sort of instrument and sensor rig attached to my computer sitting right under my desk right here. Uh, you know, this could be on a Raspberry Pi, this could be anywhere. Uh, right now I'm mocking this up with just a random walk, but it doesn't really matter where it came from. So if I uh, run this application here, uh, it will you know, take a sample and then uh, print the reading. That makes sense. Now, what I want to do is I want to get that data off this computer that the instrument's plugged into, and I want to make it available as a graph on the web. So I'm going to create an Anvil application. I'm going to uh, enable the uplink. I'm going to connect my little Python script running on my computer to this application. And then I'm going to write a, a callable function uh, that is uh, that gets a reading and it returns I'll print uh, and it returns instruments.get reading. And then uh, at the bottom of this script, I'm just going to do uh, anvil.server.wait forever, which is just it's a while one sleep loop. Uh, it just stops this script from exiting so that the get reading function, so it's there to execute the get reading function. OK, let's try running this. Well, it's connected. And now this get reading function is available to call from the web. So let's call it and plot the results. I'm going to put a plot component on here. And I'm also going to add a timer, which is a component that uh, triggers its, its tick event every, let's say, one second. OK, so let's look at the code. Oh, let's look at what happens when the timer ticks. Uh, so what we want to do is accumulate, uh, you know, accumulate a record of, of, of past uh, readings. So let's start that out. Uh, we have a list of readings and we have 
uh, a list of times those readings were taken at, and then every time the timer goes tick, uh, we append to that readings list the results of get reading. And then, uh, oops. okay, we append to the times list the current time. Okay, import that as well. Okay, and so we've, we've got these expanding lists and now we just need to plot them. So what we do is we set the data on this plot components to be a scatter plot whose X values were the times and whose Y values are the readings. And now if we run this, uh, we can see that it is recording these readings. And if we see, we look at this script running on my computer, you can see that function is running here under my desk. And so it can talk to the simulated instrument and get some kind of reading. So <clears throat> here we are displaying live data and that's all very nice. However, uh, this is only happening while this page is open and I was accumulating those lists in, again, in the Python code that's running in the web browser. So that's not really what we want. We really want to be uh, taking these readings and storing them somewhere, ideally in a database. So let's do that. Let's create a data table uh, for those readings to go in. Uh, we're going to have a, a number column for the reading itself. Uh, and a date time column for when that reading was taken. And this table is app tables.readings and we can access it from server code, which means we can access it from uplink code, which means we can write this data straight into the data table from our script here. So instead of forever, we're gonna make a loop that gets a reading and oh, writes it into, Oh, I've already imported that from amble.tables import app tables. I already put that in. Very good of me. We can take app tables.readings and we can add a row to it. And the reading is going to be uh, return value this get reading function. Uh, and when is going to be date time dot now. And then we're going to sleep for one second. So if I save this and I go back to my terminal where I'm, where I'm running this, now you can see it's getting the data once a second. And if we refresh this table, we can see that it is streaming that data into our Anvil database. All right, let's go plot it. So I'm going to make this table directly accessible to the browser code. Uh, and now instead of accumulating the readings and times, uh, we're going to say that, well, our data is just, we can just get that straight out of the database table. And so now the X values for this plot are for our in data. It's uh, the X values are going to be the, the when and the uh, Y values are going to be the readings. And now if I run this, you can see I'm still getting a live feed of the readings off this simulated instrument. But you saw as I opened the app, it already had all that historical data because of course it was loading everything out of the database. So again, an example of how you can use Anvil to take uh, whatever you're doing uh, whether it is experimental automation uh, or something in a Jupyter notebook uh, and put a user interface on it pretty simply without having to use anything except Python and function calls. Uh, this, by the way, is how uh, you get around the one limitation that is on our free plan, uh, which is that uh, we place limits on how much compute you can do on our servers and what kind of uh, modules you can install because uh, uh, loading up NumPy and doing heavy number crunching all day uh, would flatten us. Uh, so, at least it would flatten us if everybody does it. 
But that's okay because uplink code is exactly as capable as server code. So if you have you know, a machine with a lot of GPUs on it and you want to do some heavy number crunching, be our guest, stand up an uplink, an uplink script and do all your data from there. And you can still build all your user interfaces and uh, with Anvil, use our databases, knock yourselves out. So that was a brief tour through uh, the landscape of what Anvil can do. Obviously, I only covered a small fraction of uh, what's, uh, what's available, uh, but I hope I gave you a taste of the flexibility. Uh, and I am very happy to uh, spend the next 20 minutes answering your questions about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really cool looking. Um, so there were a couple of questions in the chat already. Um, so I believe there was a little bit of conversation about um, the no firewall remark um, and does the notebook poll Anvil or does the app call your function? Um, oh, right, okay, well, uh, so um, the, does the notebook poll Anvil or how can the app actually call our function? So uh, the answer was, uh, was different depend uh, in the two versions that I uh, that I built there. So in the version where the uh, um, where the application was calling that get reading function, that was Anvil polling uh, the uplink script. And in in the case of the, um, the the Jupyter notebook example, that was Anvil's the Anvil code calling into the Jupyter notebook. Um, so uh, follow up to the no firewall remark. So what hap how that actually works under the hood is that when you call anvil.server.connect, your Python code makes a WebSocket connection from uh, wherever it's running. So in this case, from my computer up to Anvil servers, or obviously if you're running this locally with the open source app server makes a connection to, uh, to wherever you're running it. And then that WebSocket is available for bi-directional communication. So you can make uh, you can make function calls up from the uplink, like we did with adding rows to the table when we were doing the experimental automation stuff, or you can, or the Anvil app can make uh, make calls uh, down that WebSocket from its end, which is what we did when we were doing when we were exposing that dogs and cats model, and what we uh, what we did in the first iteration of the experimental automation stuff. Brilliant. I think that. Yep, there's a, th there's a thank you um, in the chat. I think there's a couple more questions coming in. There was one on data table limitations. limitations but... Yes, correct. Uh, Dominic has it right. Uh, it's uh, on the free plan. It's uh, 50,000 rows and 100 megabytes of data storage. Uh, again, uh, the, a running theme you will notice me coming back to is this, all, is, it, this is all just Python. So if you need a data set that's bigger than that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with writing, you know, writing your server code to interact with a different database. You know, if, if you want to use SQL Alchemy, store something, you know, in huge data sets, you want to load massive H5 files, you want to, uh, I mean, yes, the, some of the proteomic stuff is uh, that I've seen people doing is uh, slightly eye popping. You can do all of that because it's just Python. And then you just write a function that get that does the appropriate things to it and tag it amble.server.callable and get on with your life. Brilliant. There's a there's also an injection here about injection attacks. Um, oh, uh, inject. Yes. Concurrent. So uh, that is exactly the right uh, right question to ask. Uh, one of the things you noticed is that I never had to write any HTML there, and what that meant is I was not subject to the usual sets of dangers that come with writing a program that generates source code in another programming language that has embedded source code in a third programming language and possibly a fourth, which is the normal way you build a web application. So yes, everything I was doing, you know, when I set the text of a label object, obviously that's sanitized against injection because we're not expecting HTML source code, we're expecting text. Uh, and similarly with data tables uh, against SQL injection, um, that is all done for you. Now, the specific question there was about CSVs. Uh, and CSV uh, escaping is, of course, a minefield. So no answer I'm going to give is going to be the same for every CSV parser. But uh, we do standard CSV escaping and Pandas and Excel uh, uh, lap it up just fine. I 
Okay, there's one more question there about the polling. Does that work in the local de deployment setup? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I could connect that. I could connect that uplink script to um, uh, to the uh, local app server. No problem. Uh, you can. It's all in our documentation. But what you do is you just start Anvil app server with dash dash uplink dash key, and then you give it the password, and then you tell the uplink script anvil.server.connect URL is HTTP localhost slash uplink. Uh, everything you can do, the goal is everything that you can do in Anvil's hosted servers, you can do on the app server. So the kind of workflow that you might expect if, again, if reproducibility is your goal, you can build your application iteratively in Anvil and then check it out and have this reproducible thing using the app server and it'll work just the same. Can I just ask a quick follow up question on that? Um, sure. In terms of your local deployment, how do you set up the database? Um, because the database is all, ah, yes. So what actually happens is that uh, the, actually, I, I, let me, let me share, my, share my screen for this. Um, oh, no, that was the wrong screen. So uh, let's, let's go back to this, uh, to the Anvil app server here. Um, if we uh, if we actually look at oops, sorry okay uh, look at the Anvil, the the configuration files at the top level it actually contains the database schema that your app is expecting and uh, when you start the app server it will initialize its local database uh, with that uh, with that schema and so uh, what we can actually do is uh, oh oh yes sorry. Um, if the if the server is running, which I just killed it to run that command, which wasn't very smart of me. Uh, let's get into the same virtual environment, so I have access to that command here. Okay, so if this is running, I can do psql uh, and build app server, and it will actually connect me to the Postgres database that is running uh, locally on my machine. So the app server actually contains a bundled Postgres database uh, that uh, you can uh, that is accessible with the apps uh, with the normal Anvil APIs, uh, and is also uh, something you can connect to locally. So the idea is again, it works like it does in the cloud, but sort of out of the box. Cool. Thank you. I think there was a follow up on the injection conversation about injection something. Uh, um, print a message back in the form errors. What stops the naive user printing risky data? Ah, oh, yes, uh, you're you you are seeing the um, uh, the development uh, environment in which the app logs are, um, are are viewed live next to the application. So if you actually uh, under normal circumstances, uh, what you'll see is more like this. So if I go back to I go to the app logs. And you'll see these things just appear. Uh, these messages just appear uh, in the logs. They don't, you know, they don't pop up in the browser like that. Uh, and of course, yes, of course, it is fully escaped, and you know, you're not going to get an injection attack out of that. Um, do expert users also use the web UI, or do you integrate with common IDs as well? So, the You've already seen how you integrate with uh, IDEs. If you want to use an IDE on your local machine, uh, you just git clone the application, and then you can push it back up and deploy it. It's absolutely fine, and uh, or you know, edit it locally, and then uh, and then you know, run it with the local app server. Uh, in practice, uh, even uh, expert users tend to use the web IDE because the web IDE has things like autocomplete that knows about your database, which is exactly the kind of thing that traditional web application environments can't do because there's so much complexity in between the JavaScript in your front end code and the database on the back end code that it doesn't stand a chance of being able to autocomplete your database accesses. But because Anvil is Python end to end, you could go, oh, well, that's that's just a Python object and follow it through. So the web ID is, uh, is the place that we are uh, very invested in making the uh, making experts happy to use it. Uh, but if you want to, you know, fire up PyCharm and edit it there, sure, check it out with Git, edit it with Python, PyCharm, commit it, push it back up, it runs. Uh, 
Oh, uh, so someone's asking, I think you mentioned the Python code gets compiled to JavaScript. Does that use WebAssembly under the hood or how does that work? No, it actually, it, um, it uses generated JavaScript. Uh, we, so the compiler we use is called Sculpt, S-K-U-L-P-T, sculpt.org is where you can find out more about it. Uh, I also have, if you look on our blog, um, you can find some talks from me about how that works under the hood. Uh, it compiles to JavaScript rather than WASM. Uh, and it's likely to stay that way, if only because uh, getting communicating between WASM and uh, so JavaScript land, so you know, HTML elements and DOM and so on in the browser, uh, is uh, is a fairly clunky affair. And almost all of what you're doing in client side code in Anvil is manipulating the DOM, manipulating the UI. Because if you're doing serious compute, that tends to get shipped back to the server modules anyway. So it actually uh, makes more sense to compile to JavaScript rather than compiling to WASM. Brilliant. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's a hand raise. Unmute yourself and ask. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks for the talk, Meredith. That's, uh, it's, I've been using Anvil for the last month and a half or so. Um, oh, awesome. Pleased to hear it. Um, one particular sort of pain point, I guess, that we've found is trying to work out how to collaborate on it without uh, needing to subscribe to the paid plans. So one thing, um, obviously, you can climb on Git. We usually use GitHub for um, collaborating on code. Um, but one thing I've noticed is if you want to use the sort of the extra uh, widgets or cu uh, custom components that community have made, then there's, there's like a key that gets located to the one that's cloned in your own repository and sharing that um, outside of Anvil is quite difficult. Is there a, a way to work through that issue? Uh, yes, there are workflows for that. And uh, I think probably uh, we should either take this offline or to the Anvil forum, which you can find at anvil.work slash forum um, to uh, dig into exactly how that's, uh, how that's going. Um, yes. Uh, Talk to me on there about it. Uh, there are things that I cannot currently say on a publicly recorded and streamable talk. Thank you. All right, do we have anybody else? Any more questions? I had, I had another question. Um, sure. I saw that there was a widget about, oh, it which looked like the Google Maps symbol um, uh, yes that is exactly what it is we have yeah, uh, in, you, built an integration for google maps api um can you how do you connect it to the api do you set up your own key and account yes absolutely the... so how that works is who who right yes live unrehearsed demos these always go well always. so uh let's let's start a new application don't mess up those samples so uh let's add a uh, get this out of the way map component. Now out of the box, there's actually, um, you, there's a little quota you can use uh, for free. But uh, if you're making serious use of this, you can uh, add the Google API and just enter your maps API key here. Uh, and of course, we have a Python bridge for the uh, uh, we can add a uh, Google map, let's say a, oh gosh, uh, what's the, um, oh no, uh, um, excellent, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, uh, off the top of my job, oh there we go, app.center, Google lap long, okay, yep, yeah, fine, so you can see, you can see that you can use, um, uh, the Google Maps API directly from Python. And use that sort of thing straight up. Uh, you can, of course, use alternative um, mapping widgets if you want. Uh, this is a, another of these whole features that I have not really described. But of course, there are always going to be limits to what we've imagined. Anvil is this abstraction layer over this huge web framework. Uh, well, the huge 
surface area of the browser APIs and libraries and so on. And uh, that's you know, not always going to contain everything you need. And you might need to use, for example, an external JavaScript library. Uh, and actually for this, I'm gonna show you an example uh, that uh, we made around Christmas time for our advent calendar. Uh, and what we have is a JavaScript interoperability. So what you can do is you can add a JavaScript reference to uh, your application, and then you can import the JavaScript objects directly in Python and then start using those APIs. So uh, although the answer for Google Maps happened to be, yes, absolutely, we have built-in Python support for that, uh, if you'd asked about something like Leaflet, I would have been pointing you at this. Uh, and sure enough, this allows you to uh, build, as our example, 3D models, which we know that, that that was a new thing for which Anvil doesn't already have support, but that's okay because we could grab the 3.js library and drive it from Python uh, really quite simply. Thank you. That, that was the better answers I was expecting. Um, any more questions, anybody? We tried to give those. Very good. <laughs> have I just exhausted the ability of 60 software engineers to ask questions. The pandemic must be getting to us. Well, I'd say uh, we'll probably formally call it an end there. And I will say thank you, thank you very much for a really, really excellent software demo. You're uh, very welcome. I would like to give credit, by the way, to uh, Hannah Hazzy, who's um, uh, whose demo I am giving for her because she is off having a baby. Uh, and if you are, uh, if obsessively geeking out about having a baby, that uh, sounds like the kind of thing that, you know, a software engineer that you know might do, you might want to check out on our blog where she has written a whole series of posts <laughs> about tracking pregnancy with emoji and due date tracking and so on. Um, but yes, uh, credit to her for uh, setting this up and uh, designing the demos. Uh, I am just the messenger today. Yeah, thank you very much. I have seen lots of things similar to those where people later on tracking nappy usages as well. Um, <laughs> <I mean, yeah. laughs> you should also, I should mention, you should check us out at anvil.works. And if you want uh, my email address, I have just popped it into the channel. You also saw it during the demo. It is mered at anvil.works. Brilliant. Thank you very much again. Um, just to point out, that there are some more source events so do check them out do come along um uh, next week for some talk events and then i think if anybody just wants to sort of have a more um casual chat uh please please hang around and we can we can sort of network and chat if anybody wants to to stay on the call for a few more minutes <laughs>